warm welcome to this the 153rd regular period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It's a pleasure to have you and to welcome you to this period of sessions and to the second of the hearings in this room. The hearing this morning will look at the case of Jessica Lenahan and the United States. To give some context and background, on July 2000, and 11, the Commission published, published its merits report in relation to the Lenahan case. And as you know, this is an important case in relation to the state's obligation to act with due diligence in relation to violence against women and children. The Commission issued seven recommendations and has held five working meetings with the presence of the state and the petitioners. And in our annual report in 2013, determined that the state had partially complied with the recommendations and recognizes and welcomes the initiatives which have been undertaken by the United States. We do, however, note uh, that there, is, there are still outstanding um, recommendations which haven't been complied in with, particularly in relation to the carrying out of investigations and also in relation to individual reparations and policy and legal reform in Colorado, amongst other things. And the Commission has indicated its commitment to continuing to monitor compliance. And this hearing is with a view to facilitating follow-up to the recommendations um, in the Lenahan report. Welcome to the petitioners, um, familiar, and also to um, the petitioner, Jessica Lenahan, as well. I also want to welcome the delegation from the United States. We're pleased to have you, Ambassador Lomelin, and your delegation, and we look forward to hearing from you about the developments in relation to this case. Can I hand over to the petitioners? Um, I neglected to also welcome um, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, uh, Rashida Manju, it's our pleasure to have you here and to hear from you in relation to standards. My pleasure to have you and I offer the floor to the petitioners. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to thank the Honorable Commission for offering us this opportunity to, uh, for this uh, follow-up hearing. I'm shown here by Jessica Lanahan and my colleagues, uh, Caroline, Caroline Bettinger-Lopez, uh, Alice Mayer, Alexandra Tate from the University of Miami and Chicago, Le Lenora Lapidus and Sandra Park from the American Civil Liberties Union, Angelita Bayens and Wade McMullen from the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, Risa Kaufman and Erin Smith from the Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute, and as you mentioned, we are also very fortunate to have Professor Rashida Manchu from the United Nations, Special Rapporteur of Violence Against Women. Um, this is an extremely important uh, hearing, a follow-up hearing, particularly for Jessica. Uh, we don't have, uh, as you know, as as I know, we don't have too much time in in this hearing. So I'm gonna move quickly and offer the floor to Caroline. Please. Thank you, Santiago, and thanks to the Honorable Commissioners and to the United States for your participation here today. Um, Three years ago, the Inter-American Commission issued a landmark decision, as Commissioner Robinson noted, in favor of Jessica Lenahan, finding that the United States had violated her human rights by failing to take adequate steps to protect her and her three children from domestic violence. The Lenahan decision was based on three key principles. First, the government has an affirmative obligation to protect domestic violence victims when officials are aware that those victims or their children are in danger. Second, the government has an obligation to provide a remedy when it fails to fulfill those duties. And third, family members who have, who have the right to information concerning unanswered questions as to where, when, and how their loved ones died. The Commission made seven recommendations for how the government could address those violations in Ms. Lenahan's case. The petitioners requested today's hearing to address the government's failure to implement the Commission's recommendations. We're concerned that the federal, state, and local governments have failed on four levels. First, to carry out investigations demanded by the Commission. Second, 
to provide reparations to Jessica Lenahan and her son. Third, to enact policy reforms and remedies, despite the fact that the United States government has made important progress in rhetoric and principles. And fourth, to engage meaningfully with the implementation process. This hearing today coincides in the wake of the Ray Rice F National Football League scandal with nationwide calls for structural solutions and institutional accountability in responding to domestic violence. The government has taken important steps in this direction, developing a comprehensive White House initiative to stop campus sexual assault and focusing attention for the first time within the Department of Justice on gender biased policing. The government must capitalize on the momentum of this unique moment to develop legal and social frameworks that focus not only on individual culpability, but also on systemic reform. Such initiatives must address root causes, challenge stereotypes of victims of, of gender violence, curb victim blaming, and make headway on the prevention front. It's an uphill battle, no doubt, especially in Colorado. One recent tragedy there involved a Denver woman who was shot and killed by her husband while on the phone with a 911 emergency, emergency operator. It took 16 minutes for the police to arrive, even though the average response time to high priority calls was under seven minutes. Another case in Colorado involved a domestic violence survivor who was shot and killed by her husband, who was a sheriff's, sheriff's deputy. The case was originally ruled a suicide after key witness statements, including one in which the husband confessed, were omitted or altered by the police department. He is still a det detective today. A subsequent review of the Colorado law enforcement practices and policies in responding to domestic violence found at least 18 cases over the past 15 years in which it was clear that police failed to properly re respond to a domestic violence call. And these cases are just the tip of the iceberg. Domestic violence advocates in Colorado have reported seven systemic issues relating to police responses in the state, including inadequate domestic violence training and poor enforcement of Colorado firearms law. We urge the United States government to investigate this pa apparent pattern and practice of inappropriate law enforcement response to domestic violence victims in Colorado, a problem emblematized by Jessica Lenahan's case. On a positive note, the petitioners want to acknowledge that the federal government has made sincere efforts for the first time to involve participants from state and local government at this hearing. The fact that the Colorado Governor's Office and the Castle Rock Police Department responded positively to Ambassador Lomelin's letters is encouraging. We believe that such communication with state and local officials concerning their human rights obligations should be institutionalized and regular. While we wish that the state and local entities were physically present at this hearing today, we hope that the federal government will continue to engage them in conversations concerning this case. While the petitioners have made some progress in conversations with federal officials concerning implementation of the policy-focused recommendations in this case, until recently there has been a complete lack of communication in Colorado. That must change. Colorado authorities have rejected or ignored the requests of petitioners to conduct an investigation into Jessica's daughter's deaths. We implore the Department of Justice to work with state and local authorities in Colorado to facilitate the investigation that this commission has recommended and that Jessica Lenahan so desperately seeks. As my colleagues will discuss, there are concrete steps that the federal government, the state of Colorado, and the town of Castle Rock can and should take to comply with the commission's decision. U.S. compliance with the decision is not only the right thing to do, it will also bolster our country's legitimacy in the international arena as a human rights leader. Last month, on the 20th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act, and in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, President Obama issued two presidential proclamations affirming the basic human right to be free from violence and abuse. Thirteen municipalities across the country, from Chicago to Washington, D.C. to Montgomery, Alabama, have issued similar resolutions. Acknowledging that freedom from domestic violence is a human right is a critical step. Now, the government must turn those words into action. This year marks the 15-year anniversary of the deaths of Rebecca, Catherine, and Leslie Gonzalez. It is our hope that this hearing can serve as a meaningful opportunity for the government of the United States to take meaningful steps toward compliance with the Commission's decision in this paradigmatic case of global significance. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, 
My name is Jessica Lenahan, and I want to start by thanking the commissioners and the United States for coming to the hearing today. Um, your 2011 landmark decision in my case told the world that the Castle Rock Police Department and the state of Colorado and the United States government were responsible for human rights violations against me and my children. And yet the government has made no progress in repairing my tragedy. I fear the commissioner's decision has fallen on deaf ears. As I have previously told this commission on June 22nd of 1999, I experienced the unthinkable. My three daughters were killed, their bullet-ridden bodies found inside the pickup truck. Over the past 15 years, many people in this room have heard me recount this tragic incident. I'm compelled to retell the story because to this day, their murder remains unsolved. Simon was my estranged husband and the girl's father. He came to the house where I lived with my three daughters on the afternoon of June 22nd and drove off with them and their friend, Rebecca Robinson. A judge had previously issued a restraining order barring Simon from the contact with my children, so I called the police repeatedly. I reached out, spent the night in a total panic, and the police went to dinner. They looked for a lost dog, and three officers were at a random routine stop, refusing to look for the children instead. That's what they chose to do. Pretty pathetic, you know? Um, then for reasons I will never understand, Simon drove to the Castle Rock Police Station at 3 a.m. and started on firing. The police fired back. He committed suicide by cop. He was lying dead on the ground and Rebecca, Catherine, and Leslie were found dead in the back of his truck. It was bullet ridden. There was not one piece of that truck that didn't have damage. It was in bad shape. Afterward. I was detained in a room for 12 hours and interrogated by the Castle Rock Police and other Colorado authorities. And it went on for weeks and weeks and I don't think it's ever stopped since. This is like 15 years of just torturing me. The ultimate show of inhumanity, the, the police and the press, that my girls were dead before they told me that the press knew, before my family knew. Man, this is four pages long. <laughs> in 15, sorry, y'all. In 15 years, my family and I have asked three simple questions. Who killed my girls? Where and when? Was Simon responsible? Or did the children get caught in the crossfire with the police? How can all these questions still be open? How... As a mother, do I not have the, uh, the right to know what happened to my children? I don't want to read this. I just know, look, the outcome of today could really put my life at peace, and it's time to get this done. I don't know where the federal government stands, overseeing the state, but obviously my state cannot produce what I need done on the findings of my children. So the outcome today really needs to be different than what it has been, because I don't want to sit behind this desk anymore and look at you or talk to you. Let's just get it done. I'm tired. I shouldn't have to carry this burden for you. Good morning. My name is Lenora Lapidus. I'm the director of the Women's Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union. I'd like to thank the commissioners for holding this hearing and for the U.S. for its participation. Since the commission issued its recommendations in 2001, the government has taken few concrete steps to implement those recommendations. It's now time that they do so. The first recommendation calls for an investigation into the cause, time, and place of the deaths of Jessica's daughters. This investigation is critical. 
Ms. Lenahan, like all victims of human rights violations, has a right to know the truth. As you've heard, these unanswered questions about the girls' deaths remain a constant and painful concern for her. The federal government should work with Colorado officials to make sure that that investigation happens soon. Although a letter was submitted by the Castle Rock Chief of Police indicating that he requested the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to review the case, so far to our knowledge, the CBI has refused to undertake any investigation. Similarly, there has yet to be an investigation into the systemic failures that took place that night related to the enforcement of Jessica's order of protection. Why did the Castle Rock Police ignore her calls, her multiple calls and visits, um, and request that the police go after Simon Gonzalez and search for Ms. Lenahan's children? What procedures did they have in place, and where did those fail? The government should investigate Castle Rock's policies and practices to determine what went wrong and to ensure proper enforcement of domestic violence orders of protection in the future. With regard to recommendations one and two, the state authorities must issue an acknowledgement that both the police failure to enforce Ms. Lenahan's order of protection, as well as their failure to do this investigation into the girl's death, both are violative of Ms. Lenahan's rights, and they must offer a public apology. Third, the commission called on the government to make reparations to Ms. Lenahan and her family. And as you've heard, Ms. Lenahan is struggling every day to make ends meet. This investigation needs to happen. Reparations must be made so that she can go on. In addition, the recommendations um, focused on public policy and legislative changes that need to be made. We've raised with the federal government two particular efforts on which we would like to see further progress. First, we urge the Department of Justice to issue guidance to all police departments about their obligations in responding to domestic and sexual violence and eliminating gender bias practices. This guidance could build on the investigations that the Department of Justice has recently initiated and resolved with police departments in Puerto Rico, New Orleans, Missoula, Montana, and Maricopa County, Arizona. All of those investigations um, and resolutions were for discriminatory practices, including response to domestic and sexual violence. Similar efforts should be made here. We would like this guidance issued so that police departments around the country know what their obligations are. Second, the government must take steps to incorporate human rights standards into its policies and practices addressing violence against women. We were pleased to work with the State Department and the Department of Justice to organize a roundtable last spring on domestic violence, sexual assault, non-discrimination, and human rights. That roundtable brought together federal government officials um, from various departments as well as advocates and academics to discuss incorporating human rights principles into the government's policies and practices. It's now important to follow up on that roundtable and put some of those recommendations into concrete actions. The government should provide further training, including training on this Lenahan decision. And human rights principles should be incorporated into the grant applications and agreements with police departments relating to gender-based violence. It's been 15 years since Ms. Lenahan suffered this terrible tragedy, and it's been three years since the Commission issued its recommendations. It is time now that the government comply with those recommendations to redress both the harm suffered by Ms. Lenahan and to prevent such tragedies in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable members of the Commission, delegates and colleagues, I would like to thank the petitioners firstly in the Lenahan case for inviting me to participate in this hearing regarding the state's compliance with the Commission's recommendations. And I would like to express my appreciation to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for consenting to my participation as an independent expert. I appear at these proceedings without prejudice and my participation should not be considered as a waiver, express or implied of the privileges and immunities of the United Nations, its officials and experts and missions pursuant to the 1946 Convention on Privileges and Immunities. 
It is my mandate in the United Nations to respond effectively to information to make recommendations at the local, national, regional, and international level to eliminate all forms of violence against women and remedy its consequences. I strive in my mandate to support the adoption of a comprehensive and universal approach to the elimination of violence against women, including causes relating to the civil, cultural, economic, political, and social spheres. My mandate has consistently focused on how states can effectively fulfill their international obligations to prevent, protect, investigate, prosecute, punish, and provide effective remedies. As most of us know, globally, violence against women is acknowledged as a pervasive and widespread human rights violation, impacting women globally in disproportionate numbers. Since its establishment in 1994, the mandate has studied the forms, the prevalence, the causes, and the consequences of violence. It has analyzed legal and institutional developments in the protection of women against violence and has provided key recommendations. My mandate has taken into account the intersectionality and the continuum of violence approach to analyze causes and consequences and looks at violence through both a spatial and a temporal lens. In 2011, I produced a report for the Human Rights Council looking at how violence experienced by women is generally rooted in multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination and inequalities, and it is a reflection and reinforcement of the discrimination, inequality, and oppression to which many women are subjected in public and private spaces. In this report, I argue that violence against women cannot be fully understood without also considering interpersonal, institutional, and structural forms of violence that maintain one group's advantage over another in the home, in places of employment, in terms of educational opportunities, access to resources, protection by the police and other state authorities, and access to services and benefits. Violence violates the equality and non-discrimination rights of women and girls in ways that are contingent, amongst others, on women's material conditions, individual attributes, and social occasions. My report encourages states to adopt a holistic approach to remedies, which includes an intersectional and multiple discrimination understanding of the different, different types of discrimination and the consequences thereof. Due to continued concerns about the high prevalence rate and also the norm of impunity for crimes against women, the focus of my 2013 report to the Human Rights Council was on state responsibility to act with due diligence to eliminate violence against women. In this report, I highlighted the measures undertaken by governments to try and address violence, mainly through legislative measures, institutional and policy measures, and awareness raising and capacity building activities. Despite these efforts, violence against women remains a pervasive and widespread phenomena, and no single country in the world can claim that there is progressive elimination occurring. States' efforts to comply with their due diligence obligations should not only focus on legislative reform, access to justice, and the provision of services for victims, but must also address the structural causes that lead to violence against women. The enactment of adequate legislation on violence is a first preventative step, but shortcomings in legislation have particularly negative consequences in contexts where women's subordinate status within intimate relationships, their economic dependence on male partners, their fear of being abandoned or further assaulted, and also their prior experiences with the justice system makes them more vulnerable to intimate partner violence. I would like to... Um, turn quickly to the link um, that my mandate and the UN human rights treaty bodies have had in relation to the issue of violence against women. In 2009, I conducted a site visit to the United States and my subsequent report looked at the situation of violence against women broadly. One of my findings in that report was that the, despite the laudable efforts of the Violence Against Women Act, there's very little in terms of actual federal substantive protection or prevention for domestic violence in this legislation, and subsequent jurisprudence has had a negative effect on that. More recently in this year, the two human rights treaty bodies, the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, 
have reviewed the U.S. and echoed several of the concerns that I've raised about violence against women. Directly in line with my mandate, I have received communications on the Lenahan case. Um, my predecessor and I have addressed this. Communications have been sent to the U.S. government and a more recent communication in 2013. It was a joint communication by the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples and myself on the disproportionate impact of violence against women that is faced by Indigenous communities. I uh, commend the government for its speedy response to that communication and for the acknowledgement that indigenous women in the U.S. face disproportionately high rates of domestic violence and that the Violence Against Women Act now contains an important provision allowing indigenous tribes to prosecute non-native perpetrators of dating and domestic violence, which is one of the recommendations in my report. I thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry about the time. Thank you very much, Special Rapporteur, and to the petitioners. Um, I welcome hearing the response of the state and wish to give the floor to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. We would like to once again thank the Commission, the petitioners, the distinguished UN Re Rapporteur, Professor Manjou, and Ms. Lanahan for their continued efforts to address the important issue of domestic violence. Before I begin, I would like to state that as someone who has dedicated my professional and personal career to women's human rights, I feel great empathy for Ms. Lanahan and the unspeakable heartbreak that she has had to live with for almost 15 years. The United States has repeatedly iterated that we recognize that the deaths of Leslie, Catherine, and Rebecca are unmistakable tragedies that should have never, ever have occurred. And we share Ms. Lanahan's commitment that more should have been done to prevent future violence and harm. The United States emphasizes that all states owe a moral and political responsibility to their populations to put in place laws and institutions to prevent and protect them from acts of abuse and violence by private individuals. The U.S. government has a deep and abiding commitment to preventing domestic violence, protecting its victims, and prosecuting its perpetrators. We have strong legislation, systematic enforcement of criminal laws, and extensive programs to, state, to assist state and local law enforcement authorities, as well as local service providers, in preventing and responding to domestic violence. Our commitment can be thrown, shown through many local, state, and federal programs that we have made real changes in the lives of victims of domestic and sexual violence in the decades since the passage of the Federal Family Violence Prevention Services Act in 1984, and especially the Federal Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, in 1994. Although local, state, and federal laws and programming regarding domestic violence cannot and have not prevented every individual act of private violence, the United States has made extraordinary gains in its fight to end these crimes. Since Congress enacted VAWA 20 years ago, we have reduced intimate partner violence against both men and women, sparked a wave of state law reforms, and changed the prevailing culture around this violence. Yearly domestic violence rates dropped a dramatic 64% from 1993 to 2010. Between 19 and nine, uh, 1993 and 2012, the number of individuals killed by an intimate partner declined 26% for women and 48% for men. VAWA funding has increased rates of prosecution and conviction of offenders and comprehensive services have improved the lives of survivors. Federal funding in this area has had a profound impact on communities across our nation. With funds authorized by the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, the United States Department of Health and Human Services has awarded over $2.3 billion to support shelter and other supportive services for domestic violence victims and their families. Family violence formula grants are awarded to every state and territory and over 200 tribes. In 2013, the Federal Violence Prevention Act program served 1.35 million victims and their children. In a recent two-year period, VAWA, uh, from uh, July 1st of 2011 to June 30th of 2013, VAWA grantees from the uh, Office of Violence of, uh, for Women Discretionary Programs trained a total of 687,000 service providers, criminal justice personnel, and other professionals, including over 88,000 law enforcement officers, nearly 15,000 prosecutors, and nearly 20,000 court personnel, including judges. 
in, in just one recent calendar year, 2012, 2,400 sub-grantees of OVW Stop Violence Against Women formula grants trained 215,000 professionals, including over 60,000 law enforcement officers and many, many others. In March of this year, the United States Congress demonstrated its continuing support for these efforts when it reauthorized and strengthened the Violence Against Women Act. Now, as you are aware, the United States re responded in detail to the Commission's 2011 opinion and recommendations and has participated in a number of follow-up meetings called on by the Commission, as well as private meetings with the petitioner and her counsel. The Commission acknowledged that this response represents compliance with many of the Commission's recommendations. We have also gone further and have had constructive dialogue with petitioners on some of these recommendations, which has led to separate discussions between petitioners and the Department of Justice on domestic violence uh, prevention. And we have kept the Commission updated on our efforts in this regard. Today I am pleased to offer updates to the U.S. response, including initiatives that we are taken taking to prevent domestic violence, particularly violence against women and girls. On September 6, 2011, several U.S. Uh, government representatives, including uh, Judge Susan Carbon, then Director of the Office of Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice, met with Ms. Lanahan and offered their sincere regrets for her loss. In addition, following the Commission's decision, this office reached out to the Chief of Police of the, uh, for the town of Castle Rock, Jack Hawley, about resources OVW has available for assessing and improving Castle Rock's response in domestic violence cases. In fact, Principal Deputy Director B. Hansen, who serves as the current head of the Office of Violence Against Women, has had several conversations with Castle Rock Chief of Police Colley, who has expressed his commitment to ensuring that the police department's policies, protocols, and procedures incorporate best practices for domestic violence response. He has also instituted periodic meetings with local domestic violence service providers. providers. In March of 2013, with uh, OVW funding, the International Association of Chiefs of Police conducted a two-day two training session for Colorado Police Departments in co entitled, quote, Colorado Law Enforcement Violence Against Women Leadership Training in Parker, Colorado. Some 25 law enforcement officers, prosecutors, victim advocates, and others attended, including Chief Cawley, who co-hosted this event. The training opened with videotape welcoming remarks from Principal Deputy Director Hansen. Advocates working to prevent gender discrimination and domestic violence, including Petitioner's Council, have met with leaders of the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division and its Office on Violence Against Women outside of the context of this specific case to discuss ways to collaborate on improving law enforcement responses to domestic violence and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. One outgrowth of this, this discussion was a half-day roundtable which was mentioned by our, our, our representative from the ACLU. And this roundtable was designed to introduce federal staff to who work on domestic and sexual violence issues to the human rights princ uh, principles most relevant in domestic violence to identify human rights resources relevant to their work and to encourage further collab collaboration with the sharing of best practices across agencies. In addition to staff from the sponsoring departments, the approximately 60 participants included staff from the Dep Departments of Health and Human Services, Education, Housing and uh, Urban Development, uh, Academia, and over a dozen NGO representatives, including Petitioner's Council. DOJ and the State Department in, uh, plan to reconvene the participants in January 2015 for additional discussion. These roundtables reflect the U.S.'s deep commitment to addressing violence against women, domestic violence, and sexual assault, including addressing gender-based police discrimination. Further, the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division Special Litigation Section works to protect the civil rights of persons interacting with state and local law enforcement. This section has entered into several agreement, uh, settlement agreements and consent decrees to address patterns of gender-based discrimination by law enforcement agencies, such as in New Orleans, Louisiana, Missoula, Montana, and in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. As we made clear in our 2012 response, there remain some recommendations of the Commission that the U.S. government is not in a position to address. 
First, the executive branch does not have a legal authority that would permit it to pay reparations recommended by the commission absent an act of Congress. Second, the special lit litigation section does not have the authority to conduct a civil investigation into discriminatory, discriminatory conduct by law enforcement affecting an individual. Rather, the division's civil authority is to investigate a pattern or practice of conduct by a law enforcement agency that systematically violates people's rights. Moreover, the Civil Rights Division is limited to seeking prospective injunctive relief where there is evidence of a pattern or practice of ongoing constitutional or statutory violations as opposed to seeking redress for past violations. We have regularly notified authorities in the state of Colorado about the Commission's recommendations and hearings and encouraged their response and participation including the Attorney General, Governor's Office, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and the Town of Castle Rock. Prior to this hearing, we also sent notice to State Senator Irene Aguilar, who the petitioner's state has been active on this case. On October 22nd, the State Department received extremely positive letters from both the Governor of Colorado and Castle Rock Chief of Police Jack Colley. While no Colorado officials were ultimately um, available to appear here today, they have provided substantive un updates on what they have been undertaking to implement the Commission's recommendations, which we are happy to share with the petitioners. The Governor's Office specifically stated that it has made legislative changes in the wake of Ms. Lanahan's case. Further and importantly, they have encouraged Ms. Lanahan and her counsel to engage with them on specific proposals to address domestic violence in the state of Colorado. Additionally, Castle Rock Chief of Police Cauley laid out in some detail their actions to address the recommendations, including meeting with the ACLU on this mo matter, hosting workshops, asking for assistance on the use of force, and forwarding information to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation as requested by the petitioners. Finally, Colorado State Senator Irene Aguilar has gone so far as to offer to host the Inter-American Commission and to introduce legislative changes on domestic violence. We strongly believe that the Commission should engage directly with Senator Aguilar on this matter. Commissioners and petitioners, the State of Colorado has assured us that it takes this matter very seriously and is dedicated to preventing domestic violence. We encourage the petitioners to increase their efforts in the State of Colorado. We are pleased to hear of all of the good work the State is doing to address domestic violence and it's very clear to us that they are very open to engagement with you all. We would also like to offer to participate in a thematic hearing on domestic violence at the Commission's next period of sessions in March of 2015. We will ensure high-level participation by U.S. government officials and believe that this will offer a fuller picture of the United States' commitment to these issues. We would welcome Ms. Lanahan's participation in this general th thematic hearing. I will conclude here by stating that since the passage of the Violence Against Women Act 20 years ago, the United States' response <coughs> to domestic violence has been substantial. As Vice President Biden stated during Domestic Violence Awareness Month last year, every October we come together as a nation to mourn those who have died, to celebrate those who have survived, and to renew our commitment to end domestic violence. But someday, because of these efforts, the, viol the violence will end. Commissioners and petitioners, I assure you that the United States' commitment to these issues is unwavering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lomelin. Um, I wanted to offer the floor to my colleagues who may have observations or questions. Um, could I first turn to the country rapporteur, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to both delegations and especially to uh, Ms. Uh, Lenahan. Uh, this is a uh, a uh, very important landmark case uh, for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, I myself have been at the Commission for a number of years and had the chance to, to be at the uh, hearing on the merits uh, in this case and, and later participate, so participate in the adoption of the merits report. And uh, because of the nature of the case, it's, uh, uh, it's crucial that uh, uh, full enforcement of it is accomplished. Um, I appreciate the efforts uh, done by the uh, government of the United States uh, related to this case. 
and also and including the fact that uh, coordination is taking place with the uh, state. Uh, this is uh, crucial for the enforcement of the Commission's decisions uh, in federal states. And uh, the fact that that coordination exists, uh, it's very important for this and for our cases. Um, well, we appreciate the, the, that there have been some steps uh, in, in enforcing the, the decision. There are a number of uh, uh, recommendations um, issued by the Commission in its merit report that, that are pending and that uh, uh, we would very much uh, see in uh, uh, progress soon, including a reparation for Mrs. Lenahan and also to open an investigation that uh, would make really clear what happened uh, uh, on this uh, tragic uh, situation. Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por la presencia aquí en el, de los peticionarios y sobre todo de la señora Jessica. Gracias también por las explicaciones de la embajadora. La violencia doméstica es, siempre está muy vinculada con la violencia fatal contra los niños. Sabemos que Estados Unidos en los últimos 20 años ha hecho un esfuerzo enorme y que mucho ha avanzado. Eh, es una pena que este caso específico eh, todavía esté, quede en, en la impunidad por la falta de una investigación adecuada. La investigación realizada no fue suficiente. La comisión ha manifestado eh, su inconformidad con esa investigación y esperamos que, que este caso no quede en la impunidad porque la impunidad es la que crea la tolerancia. Eh, también eh, me, me sorprende mucho que el mecanismo para encarar la violencia doméstica, como el llamado telefónico y la orden de restricción, eh, no haya funcionado porque la sociedad cree que si existe ese mecanismo es que va a tener la respuesta de parte del Estado. Y es, es doblemente eh, culpable el Estado que tiene un mecanismo pero que no asegura que funcione y que dé las respuestas adecuadas. Me gustaría saber de parte del Estado cuáles son los impedimentos para realizar la investigación que requiere la señora Jessica para tener la verdad y para tener paz. Gracias. Deputy Executive Secretary, Elizabeth Ave Merced. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. It's really a question in follow-up to that um, post by Commissioner Ortiz, and it concerns the recommendation to investigate and to clarify the cause of deaths of the girls. And it is to recall that the Commission has had the opportunity to work on a range of cases concerning the killings of women and girls in a range of different countries in the region and has seen a number of measures of investigation taken even years later and even in countries that have very complex questions of federalism such as federal state collaboration in investigation, such as federal assumption of certain measures of investigation, opening new lines of investigation, interdisciplinary teams of experts, and in some instances where the capacity wasn't available in the country, the invitation to experts from abroad to participate in measures of investigation. And it's um, to mention, to ask for information if, if the parties have it now, or to indicate that the Commission would hope to receive information in this phase of follow-up on measures of investigation that can be taken um, with the state, through the state, and in addition to the state of Colorado uh, in order to fully clarify the circumstances of the deaths of the girls. Thank you, Madam President. And finally, Rosa Celorio from the Rapporteurship on the Rights of Women. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the petitioners and the state for their remarks on this very important case for us at the Commission. I just had uh, a line of questions, very brief, on the question of prevention and non-repetition of these kinds of events because a lot of the 
uh, themes that are incorporated in the recommendations of the merits report um, are actually centered around these two aspects in particular. One, if the petitioners could share with us, and it doesn't have to necessarily be here in the hearing, it can be after the hearing, more information on the process that led to the adoption of the domestic violence resolutions in the different jurisdictions, um, and the kind of hints that you had of different kinds of political will, the context, and also the constituencies that were necessary to be able to achieve this kind of document, and the expected follow-up that you um, that you would hope to have from these domestic violence um, resolutions. Um, also, if you could provide information of uh, any follow-up that could be anticipated from the domestic violence roundtable that was already organized. Um, it seems like a very significant event um, and an important step, and it would be great to have some information um, of what concrete next steps you would expect from this roundtable. And lastly, the aspect of training of law enforcement officials um, and also justice officials when it comes to the issue of domestic violence. Several of the recommendations do highlight training. They do highlight the importance of protocol and as rapporteurship, we're learning and we're gathering um, information from different countries as to what could be a best practice, what could be, um, what could work better, especially thinking of the obligation to act with due diligence as a whole. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we've had a full round of questions, but I just wanted, as the rapporteur for the rights of women, to also echo um, the Commission's continued commitment to the monitoring of compliance with this case. In our experience, the question of investigations is the one issue on which we often have weak compliance, and I think um, Ms. Lenahan has indicated over and over how important this question is to her um, and the right to know the truth about what happened on that day. I also want to indicate the Commission's strong interest um, in the continued dialogue and the growing dialogue with the state of Colorado uh, and its interest in seeing that advance. Um, I'm particularly interested in knowing um, the results and whether there's been any effort to evaluate the results of the efforts in Colorado to strengthen policing, um, given the indications from the governor and others of efforts which have already been underway and the methodologies used uh, to evaluate progress being made there or elsewhere in relation to improved policing standards. And then finally, um, to learn more from the state in relation to the activities at the federal level like the Round Table and others of the extent to which international human rights standards relating to violence against women, particularly the due diligence standard, has been integrated into new standards and policies for policing um, in relation to violence against women. Can I give the petitioners a few minutes to respond? We don't have much time, but about three minutes, perhaps. Santiago, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I'll be very, very uh, brief. Uh, you know, most of the human rights cases decided by this commission and other human rights tribunals uh, uh, have you know two main uh, uh, goals. Uh, number one, uh, responding to the individual petition and to and to the victim behind the case, uh, and number two, trying to address uh, resolve those structural problems that facilitate those type of violations. What we mainly hear from the from the state today is that they've taken steps on on addressing the the general. Um, uh, the issues, you know, the general structures that uh, facilitate these violations, and, and we will respond some of that because we believe that that has not uh, yet uh, been fully complied. But besides that general aspect, there is one thing that is extremely much more important, which is the individual case, the case of Jessica, what happened to her kids. As she said it very clearly, there has been no progress in repairing my tragedy. How can all these questions still be open? I mean, she said it very, very clearly and there is no advance on that aspect. And under any standard, it is clear that there is state responsibility, whether it's the duty to prevent, whether the duty to respect, whether it's duty to investigate. There has been no progress. And that's what the government needs really to take seriously because we should not let those general changes of policies or legislation that hopefully will prevent in the future for the things to happen, we need to focus on the individual case, and that's no progress there. 
That is what our laws promise to do. And we're made to abide by your laws, but you are not. I don't, I, I don't get it. Like, don't give us false hope. Don't give me a restraining order and then kill my kids. That's what you did. You promised to save me, to protect me. You didn't. You didn't do any of that. So either change the wording, quit making promises, but quit, you know, it's a false security. It's bullshit. Sorry. I want to respond to a few points uh, that the commissioners and, and staff asked about um, and respond to a few points in the government's uh, statement. I, I think it's, it's critical uh, that this not be about the petitioners conducting outreach to the state of Colorado. That's an essential ingredient in the larger mix. But um, with all due respect, Ambassador, your, your request to petitioners to continue our outreach to Colorado is one piece of the puzzle, but it is not sufficient in and of itself to address the larger international obligation of the United States government to respond to the violations that are at stake here, nor is it uh, responsive to uh, the, the Commission's recommendations um, that the, the state at all entities, uh, federal, state, and local, um, all be integrally involved in that process. Um, and, and I think, ultimately, this is about all of us putting creative hats on and, um, and thinking outside the box about what implementation means. Um, we are making the road by walking here in the United States, but as Elizabeth Abby Merced said, there are models that we can look to from other countries, um, including other Federalist countries, uh, that have uh, precedent for us to follow. And so um, we need not go this alone without, um, without looking uh, for models elsewhere. Um, we've had very encouraging interaction with uh, Senator Aguilar in, in Colorado, as you mentioned, um, who is Jessica's senator and has taken a very uh, keen interest in her case. Um, but the progress that we have made thus far in the state of Colorado has largely been at the behest of the petitioners. We were very encouraged to see um, the responses of the governor and the Castle Rock uh, police chief to the government's uh, letters recently. Um, and that is something that must not be an ad hoc um, or one-off uh, instance of outreach, but rather we hope is the beginning of a continued uh, collaborative form of outreach um, with state and local officials. And so um, we hope that this is the beginning of a new chapter, but I, 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 it's difficult for us at the same time to sit here and hear the government say on the one hand, that there is outreach to state and local officials, and hopefully that that's uh, going to be a continued commitment, but that on the other hand, uh, the ball is in the petitioner's court and that no remedies exist for this very, very important aspect of the case, which is providing justice to Jessica Lenahan. Um, so we need to put our creative thinking caps on, we need to work together and, uh, and figure this out. As Jessica said, I don't think that um, we've hit a brick wall, but we need to to push forward together. Thank you, Ambassador Lemelin, or your team, if you wish to respond. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to respond on the question about whether or not the Department of Justice can initiate a, an investigation. Um, we have answered this question before, beginning in our 2012 response to the, to the Commission's uh, recommendations. And, and we've done it again in several meetings with uh, the petitioner and with petitioner's counsel. Um, and we encourage you to review that answer again. Um, I think we've repeated it again today, and there really isn't more that we can add. Um, the Special Litigation Section of the Department of Justice, which is in the Civil Rights Division, has authority to open a civil investigation 
into a pattern or practice of conduct by law enforcement agencies that systematically violate people's rights. But the special litigation section does not have legal authority to conduct an investigation into a single incident or into uh, a discriminatory act affecting an individual. Um, and this is the, uh, these are the authorities that the Department of Justice of the United States has. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the response of the state. In the eyes of an international human rights body such as ours, um, the answer is not so much about what the, de the Department of Justice can do, but more what the United States as a state can do. And um, the commission continues um, to make clear the importance of the obligations which you have and also the recommendations which you have made are ones which belong to the state to be undertaken by the appropriate bodies within the state, which may be federal, which may be state. Um, but I agree that there's a need to think creatively about how this can be achieved in the context um, of a legal system where there are some challenges. Um, I want to thank all the petitioners, the special rapporteur, Ambassador, you and your delegation for participating in this hearing. Um, or continued monitoring of compliance with this particular report continues. And you have my commitment as the Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in that respect, and I think equally of the country Rapporteur in that respect. Thank you very much.